Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you on this Sunday morning. We want to invite you, whether you're joining us online or here today, come on, get a seat, and let's all stand up and worship the King of Kings. Isn't he worthy? He saved us. He died on the cross for us, and he invited us into an intimate relationship with him that we get to come together and worship him and his word says that he comes to inhabit our praises he's here this morning he's here let's let's sing it like we believe it
over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus You're the name above all names. Thank you, Father. You are holy, holy, holy. Lord, we see you moving. You are evident. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. 
winter storms made way for spring in every season from where come before you to praise you, to worship you, to lift our songs as one song, our voice as one voice, to praise your holy and mighty name. Father, we say that you are worthy of our praise, God. We are here to worship you in song and in word. Lord, you are holy and you are worthy of all praise. We bless your great and mighty name in Jesus' name. And all his people said, amen and amen. You can turn to your neighbor and greet one another, just say hello.
on. There we go. All right. You have to turn on the anointing when you're around here now. Just <laughs> oh, well, it's good to gather in the house of the Lord. This is this is um, Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, weekend Thanksgiving week where we get to uh, give thanks for all the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. And so I am so grateful that that we can uh, have a thankful heart. We have so much to be thankful for. Um, God is is good. It's funny. I I um I know um. This week also in football, I think, is, a, is rivalry week, so a lot of the teams match up, the classic rivalries throughout the nation, and it just, it was funny, as I was sitting there, I just, my, what popped into my mind was uh, when uh, Lou Holtz was the coach, he was a coach at NC State at one time, but he was a coach at Notre Dame, and Notre Dame uh, was playing SMU, SMU is Southern Methodist University, so the Methodist and the Catholics were playing, the Protestant and the, and the Catholics were, were, were playing. And so the interviewer asked Lou Holtz, do you think that God cares who wins? Got the mic in his face, and he said, well, no, I don't think God really cares who wins, but his mother does. And so he, anyway, so that was his viewpoint on it, so I don't know what happened. I can't remember who won, but God knows. Psalm 100 says this, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. And then he gives us three reasons to give thanks. He says, because God is good all the time, as we say. God is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures for all generations. So I'm thankful that we have a God that we can give thanks to because he is good. His goodness is, is evident in our lives, evident in our church is life. And uh, it's so awesome to see the fingerprints of God, the hand of God, when we look and see what he has done. He's done amazing things in our midst. So tonight uh, at 5 o'clock, we're going to have our annual report, church gathering, family meeting, and we'll just give a report on, uh, uh, on, the, on the church finances, ministries, uh, and the future. So I hope you'll join us. Uh, it'll be a uh, about an hour meeting, um, and then we'll break for cookies and hot chocolate. So hope that you can come. It, if not, come late and get the cookies and the hot chocolate. But uh, it'll be a good time. God has knitted our hearts together. And then next Sunday, I do, do want to announce that uh, we have a special guest speaker from Kenya. Uh, his name is Michael Musambu. And Michael was a village boy that got saved years ago, came to Jesus, met him, and he began to, to serve the Lord. He has a real heart for uh, college, uh, high school and college age uh, students. And he's, his ministry has been going on for about 20 or so years, 20 years. And uh, recently, they had a real move of God, and they've had over 100,000 Kenyans come to Christ. I mean, that's a, that is amazing what God's doing. And so we said, come and speak and help a rub that anointing on us so we can see that kind of harvest but there is God is moving around the world and uh, uh, there's reports coming out of Iran that uh, there's a tremendous moves of God and uh, we want to see that here and God is not God is just looking for opportunity so we want to give him an opportunity to use us um, so those are the the main things if you want to give uh, we have a tithe box in the back that you can give uh, or also online but with that, I want us to welcome Pastor Robin as he comes uh, to minister to us. So let's welcome him. Pray a quick Have blessing. Me. Lord, I just thank you for Robin, thank you for his love for you. I thank you that he carries your word and your truth. Lord, use him this morning to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I thank you for the golf clap coming up. That was awesome. So today, I want to talk about living in truth. That's the titles for today's message. I want to talk about the complete freedom we have and the power we have when we live in the truth. Jesus said in John eight thirty two, "You will know the truth, 
and the truth will set you free. You're going to have to participate with me this morning several times, so we might as well start right now. I'm going to let you finish the sentence. You'll know the truth, and the truth, it will set you free. Jesus was free because he lived in the truth, and we want freedom, but we can't have freedom until we see like Jesus saw, until we think like Jesus thought. And getting set free, that's why it's a process. Getting set free happens when we abandon the burden of our illusions and walk in the freedom of God's truth. What we have to understand this morning is that we do buy into the illusions of this world. And every illusion is a lie, and every lie is a burden. And that's the sentence that you're going to help me with all the way through the message. My part is to say every illusion is a lie, and your part is to say every lie is a burden. Every illusion is a lie, and it's the truth. And my, my goal is to leave no room for doubt regarding this. Jesus said to us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But my life doesn't feel that light. I don't know about yours. Life doesn't feel light. It feels heavy. I'm in my 60s, right? And I'm thankful for my health. And I pray that it holds up. And I I have the privilege of overseeing and help pastoring two churches. And then in our family, my wife, Kathy, uh, three or four months ago, became the CEO of a nationwide ministry. A nationwide ministry that's going worldwide now in six countries. It's a ministry that takes the gospel to those in prison. And this year, through Prison Alliance, over 14,000 people have come to know Christ. And it's a ministry that's just exploding. And on top of that, you know, I'm a father of six. My children are spread all around the world. And and I live with the heartache of I don't ever get enough time with them, ever. Ever. Kathy and I are privileged at this point in our life to be raising two Belarusian daughters because clearly God asked us to do that. Four years ago, we took them full time, right? And they're every much our daughters as any other children that we have. And so there's, there's our daughter's lives. They're, neat, they're neck deep in sports and youth group and Friends, Alina has four AP classes and an honor class this year, and Lisa's similar. They're just busting it academically, and it's a gauntlet. It's a gauntlet. We're just starting the beginning of the college hunt, and which is its own juggernaut, right? And don't get me started about the leaves in the yard right now, or the unexpected dental expense, or you know, it's a season in our family where there's just a lots of deadlines and lots of responsibilities and burdens and opportunities. <laughs> Boom. But your life's not different than mine. We have stories that are being written. Your life is a story that's still being written. And, 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 and we don't really know the end of the story, right? Because it's unfolding before us. And when we look at our story being written and, and we care, right? Then it, then, and we see through the lens of this world. Then those stories can become a burden, Life becomes heavy, and yet Jesus said, my yoke is light, my burden is light, and my yoke is easy. And yet we get so stuck in the the thickness of the illusion that we don't even understand that there's a stark choice in front of us every single day, that life doesn't have to be heavy that the burden could be light because we have a choice. And my assignment today is to describe to you how prevalent, how deep, how commonplace our buy-in is to the illusions of this world, how we have spent most of our life believing the lies of our culture rather than the truth of his word. So when I was thinking about this, I thought about the movie The Matrix because it's really, it's like, it's like the perfect Example: The Matrix is the world as we were taught to see it. And so today I'm going to give you the opportunity. You can take the blue pill, and you can go home, and you can forget all about this. You can wake up tomorrow, and life will go on just as it always has. 
or you can take the red pill and you can take it to heart and see how deep the rabbit hole goes. Because what I'm telling you today is mind-boggling true, and it will, in fact, set you free. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you to quit living in the illusion of the matrix and invite you into the totally uncomfortable, completely liberating power of abandoning your illusions and seeing life as God sees it. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Paul is describing the difficulty that we have seeing. And this is what it says. We can see and understand only a little about God now. As if we were peering at his reflection in a poor mirror. But someday we are going to see him in his completeness face to face. Now all that I know is hazy and blurred. But then... I will see everything clearly, just as God sees clearly into my heart right now. So are you ready to blow back some fog and begin living with greater clarity? Living with greater clarity, that is, seeing rightly, means abandoning the illusions of time, death, success, control, and wealth. And I don't have much time, but I'm going to take the time that I have and, 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 and take these apart piece by piece. And I want you to remember every time that we look at one of the illusions, that every illusion is a lie and every... Amen. The first illusion in the matrix is the illusion of Tom. Tom is an illusion. We measure ourselves by, in our lives by our stage in life, right? Because we we're like, well, you know, I graduate in two years, or I can't wait to get married, or we're in the kid zone, or I'm five years from retirement. Or, and I want to say to you, truly, truly, age is a distraction. Because truly, truly, God doesn't care. And he doesn't see it as a limitation or an obstacle. It has no bearing on your usefulness to him, none. So you just look at the examples in Scripture. How old was John the Baptist when he was called by God to be a prophet? Do you know? He was in the womb, okay? How old was Mary when God tasked Mary with like the greatest assignment in human history, raising his only son? How old was she? 13, 14, 15? How old was Samuel when God called him to be a prophet? First Samuel 3.1, he, he was, according to Josephus, 11 or 12. 11 or 12. You do? <laughs> how, old, how old was Jesus when he started his ministry? He's a roughly 30, right? That's a little more reasonable. How old was Abraham when God called him to leave everything and, and, and begin his great adventure of faith? How old was he? He was 75. 75. How old was Sarah, when, Abraham's wife, when she gave birth to her first child? 90. How old was Moses when God called him out of a burning bush to set his people free? 80. So, I'm just saying, okay, does time make any difference? Does age make any difference? It doesn't define us as saints. And so if you're looking at yourself through the limitations of your age or experience, young or old, you're buying into the illusion of Tom. I promise you that when God scours the earth and he looks for somebody to represent him on this planet, a minister through which to move, that he doesn't start thinking, okay, I'm going to plant a church. I need a 30-something who wears skinny jeans. <laughs> That's not what he's thinking. I mean, take our own beloved Pastor Jim. He was 62 when we started New Path. He looked at him and said, 62 in saggy jeans. He'll do. <laughs> I'm saying time is irrelevant. Time of life is irrelevant. There's no perfect time, no right time, no wrong time, no right age, no wrong age. The perfect time is when God asks. And when God asks, then prep time is a distraction. And past time is a false narrative. Retirement is a deception. You talk about living in the illusion of the matrix. We have this crazy American concept of retirement, and I see it. I see it all the time. People don't just retire vocationally. They retire spiritually. 
They just take their foot off the gas because they feel like they've earned something in the golden years. I fall prey to the illusion. I'm in, I'm in my mid-60s, right? And, and, and so a friend said to me, he said, uh, it's just, oh, he said, he said, Robin, it's the fourth quarter. There's no timeouts. I'm saying, oh, my God. He said, if you're going to get it done, you've got to get it done now. It's a lie. Because here's the truth. I have exactly as much time as I need to get done what God has preordained for me to do. I'm telling you that every lie is an illusion and every... Even how long we live, it's not predictable. And I'm going to say to you, and I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but it's not meaningful. What matters is not how long I live, but did I use the time that I had to do the good works that God prepared in advance for me to do, Ephesians 2.10. We've got to tear down this matrix that we've built our life around because time is an illusion. And the coup de grace is this. God is eternal. And we are too. You have been given the gift of eternal life. John 17, 3. This is eternal life, to know the one true God and to know Jesus Christ whom you sent. So what I want you to do is I just want you to take a deep breath and relax. You are not running out of time. We are eternal. I bind to the illusion. I see it in my life all the time. How many times have I said to people that time is the most precious resource that I have? I can always make more money, but I can't make more time. It's a lie. It's a lie. We let time pressure us, but I'm telling you that we're eternal, and that means this. Time is the one thing that we have got forever of. Which brings us to the, to the grand second illusion that we live under, which is death. Death is an illusion. The death of Tom means the death of death. It's like dominoes. Right? Because, because when you feel the pressure of Tom, right, death is the ultimate hard stop. It's like, oh, that I'm going to run out of Tom. And it's, it's, as I thought about this, it was so interesting to me to realize that the first lie that Satan ever told in Scripture was about death. God said to Adam and Eve, he said, you can eat, you can eat of anything and everything except this one tree in the middle of the garden. Don't eat the fruit of that tree or you will surely die. And then the serpent came to Eve and said, you'll not surely die. Is the first lie. And guess what? He's still lying about it. Except this happened. God gave us eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so he had to flip the script. Now he says, you're going to die. And everything's going to be lost because our lives are dust in the wind. You remember the song? All we are is dust in the wind. Just a, a drop of water in an endless sea. All we do crumbles to the ground that we refuse to see. It's a lie. Remember, every lie is an illusion. Remember that every lie is an illusion and every... I don't care how old you are sitting in this room today, you're not going to die. Wake up. We've been given the gift of eternal life. We don't have a hard stop. What happens is when we feel like we have this hard stop is that we look at our lives and they're not what we imagined that they would be. They didn't live up to the expectation of our imagination. And then we, and then we start to get tempted to think that our lives have been insignificant and then we forget. We forget that every action done, large or small, in His name, for His glory, has created an eternal ripple of wealth. I mean, every cup of cold water given in His name matters. And I'm going to tell you that you probably don't know what you've done that actually matters in this life. You're not going to know. I, I talked to a pastor the other day. And this is what he said to me. He said, um, 
He said, you know, I, I, I pastored 25 years. I never made more than 60000 a year. And I, I look at the church I pastored, and I think that I was a failure. He said, but I managed to take the money that I had, and I invested it. And my net worth is now over a million dollars. And he said, sometimes I, I look at myself, and I think... You're a failure, and sometimes I look at myself and I think, you're really something. It's just so interesting. And I said to him, I'm going to pray for you because I'm pretty sure that what you're celebrating about your net worth is not something that Jesus is all that excited about. But that work that you did in the shadows where you cared for people the bulk of your life that there's an eternal reward that he's celebrating right now that you see what he sees when he sees you I'm not sure we'll ever know what actually mattered because the thicker the the illusion of our oncoming death, the fainter the smell of heaven, and the fainter the smell of heaven, the poorer we feel in this life. But what we know when we know that we're eternal is that heaven awaits, and it changes everything. It really it changes everything. When you lose a loved one, for instance, you know they're not lost to you forever. They're lost to you for a moment, and then the moment's gone. That's the truth. Because death is not the end of time. Death is a beginning for us. So don't fear death, my friends, because death is an illusion, and every illusion is a lie. When I came this close to death at age 52, I mean, it was probably this close, I should have died. I saw my cardiologist. I got a new cardiologist. And so I gave him all my stuff, and he looked at the tape. The, the, my my surgery's on a CD, and he 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 apparently he watched it. So I'm meeting my new cardiologist. <laughs> this was last year, for the first time. And so I sat down in the chair, and he looked at me, and he said, "I just have one question for you." I said, "Okay." He said, "How did you live through that?" I mean, I should have done. And I became very, very grateful for every day that I have on this earth. I mean, truly grateful when I get up. I am so grateful to be alive. But there's illusion in that. Because my days of gratitude are never going to come to an end. Because my life is never going to come to an end. Yes, at some point, I get to shuck this body like you would an ear of corn, right? That's going to happen. And hallelujah for that. Okay, I'm just saying the longer I live, the, 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 the less I, I look, the more I look forward to shucking this mortal coil, right? Because here's the deal. We're eternal. We've been given the gift of eternal life. And so why labor under the human construct of time and death? They're illusions. It's not the truth of Scripture. And here's a third one. Success. I want to say success is a grand illusion. Do you know what body dysmorphia is? It's, when you, it's when, you, when you look in the mirror and you obsessively focus on a perceived flaw in your appearance. The flaw might be minor. It might not even exist. But it's all that you can see when you look at yourself in the mirror or you look at a picture of yourself. So most of us have a little body dysmorphia, I'm going to say. Most of us. But that's not the only dysmorphia we have. So we all have what I'm going to call productivity dysmorphia, meaning you can never do enough. You can work all day, all week, all the time. You can do all that is human being possible, and at the end of the day, it's not enough. There's so much that's still undone, and all we can really see when we look at our life is what hasn't yet been done. 
Every one of us has a different way of looking at our lives and defining our lives and defining a success in our life, which is a huge problem. I'm going to say it's a huge problem when you define success in your life or you let your culture define success. I mean, who's, who, who are you to say if you're a success? Who are you to say? Who does you say you're a failure? Defined by who? Who set the parameters for you? Was it your parents? Your peers, your spouse, your boss? You feel terrible about yourself because of your, something your boss said about you? It's like, or is it an amalgam of all those things? So it's because, of, because we let other people define success for us. There's often this really painful gap in our lives between our objective accomplishments and our own sense of success. And all we can see is what we failed at. And the only solution is this. Don't, don't, be the, don't be the final judge of your own success because you're pretty horrible at it. And the comparison trap, it gets you every time, doesn't it? I was with, I was with a guy the other day, and he was, just talk, he was just talking to me, and he was talking about his pastor. He loves his pastor that I win. And he was just talking about his pastor, and he said, yeah, my pastor has planted 500 churches. I was like, and what I said betrayed what I was feeling. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> what I was feeling is, oh, what is that? It was intimidating to me. And genuinely, later that day, I reflected on that. And I thought, well, is his life more valuable than mine, more successful than mine? And the only answer is, who am I to judge? Only God has that right. Because I promise you this, when you see you, you don't see what Jesus sees when Jesus sees you. Because when you let Jesus determine what is a value in your life, it's going to be wildly different than what our culture says is a value in your life. I mean, the perfect example is in the temple. It's a, it's a full house in the temple, and the temple is one of those amazing wonders. And, and there's this line of people giving. You know, all the movers and shakers have shown up, and the trumpets are sounding, and they, they announce their gifts, and they give it. But he sees this, this nobody of a nothing widow sneak up and drop a penny in the plate. And he says, hold the press. This woman has done more than all of you. She is greater than you all. You've given out of your abundance and she's given all that she has. What do you believe about your life? Is it what you've been taught to believe? Or is it based on what God has to say? 2 Corinthians 5.16. Paul says this. We no longer regard, from now on then, we regard no one from a worldly perspective. What a great idea. That it's not about how much money they have or how good looking they are or how ripped or how famous. Or We regard no one from a worldly perspective. Just That's the matrix. He says this in, in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5. Paul wrote, But with me it's a very small thing if I'll be judged by you. He basically says, I don't really care what you think. Or by any human court. And then he says this profound thing. In fact, I don't even judge myself. What if you, what if you made that commitment? Like this, just between now and next Sunday, you just said, look, I'm not going to judge myself. Every time I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to judge myself, I'm going to say, no, I've made a commitment. I'm going to leave that to God. I'm not going to judge myself because I'm not going to live under the burden of the matrix of success as defined to me by this world, but I'm going to let him define me, and it's up to him. He says this, he continues, for I, know, I don't know anything against myself. Like, his conscience is clean, right? Yet, yet that doesn't mean, all right, yet I'm not justified by this. But he who judges me, is the Lord therefore judge nothing before the appointed time until the Lord comes. You may have a judgment about your life. Don't. Don't. Don't give anybody but God that power, including yourself. Because only God sees clearly. When we look in the mirror, we have dysmorphia. 
It can be financial dysmorphia, moral dysmorphia, vocational dysmorphia, relational dysmorphia, but we don't see clearly. Sometimes you look in the mirror, you think more of yourself than you should. Sometimes you look in the mirror and you think less of yourself than, than you should. So here's the advice. Just abandon the matrix altogether because success is an illusion. And illusions are built on lies. Every lie is an illusion and every... Yeah, I don't know if I got that backwards, but you, we all got it. I have one more. It's the illusion of wealth and control. Okay, so now we're going to get into this part of the matrix that's so hard to abandon. And I'm not going to be able to give it the time that it deserves, but here's the short story. We're prone to idolize money because money has the characteristics of deity. Money gives us power. Money gives us a sense of control. So when Paul writes Timothy, this is 1 Timothy 6, 17. He says this. He says, tell those who are rich not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone. But their pride and trust should be in the living God who always richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. So there's nothing wrong with being rich. But Jesus, Jesus says there's caution that comes with wealth. Namely, don't trust in it. Your bank account is not the source of your provision. Your, your employer is not the source of your provision. Your investment firm is not the not It's not your provision. God is your provision. Your bank account is a reflection of his provision. So if God is truly our father, then we have to trust him to provide. So can we really? Can you? Can you count on him to provide? Can you? Are you sure? The reason we struggle with the answer to that question is because we've tied our wealth to our sense of control and well-being. But our security has to come from our relationship with him. And on that basis, Jesus says this. Stop worrying. Stop. You don't need to worry. What are you doing? When you worry, you can know you've bought into the illusion of the matrix. It's the telltale sign. This is what he says. I mean, this is pretty stout stuff that I'm... <laughs> I feel like we read it and just kind of blow it off as nice words. This is the truth. Matthew 6, 25... Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not worry. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about your body, what you will wear. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns and let your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they are? Verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. And yet I tell you that, that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And here's the point. I mean, if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's it. All these things will be added to you. So we have to give our life to him. Our trust is in him. When we give our life to him, we give our clothes to him, and we give our house to him, and we give our food to him, and we give our future to him, and we know that he commits to take care of us. 
This is the illusion of wealth. The illusion of wealth is that we're the owner of all that we possess, and therefore we are in control. And it's a deep, deep, deep deception. In the parable of the sower, there's two reasons that, that Jesus gives that the seed of faith does. Mark 4, and here it is. Here's the two reasons. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. The deceitfulness of wealth is that money has the characteristics of deity and that we trust in money more than we trust in God. And what a burden. Every illusion is a lie and every is truth. Wake up, my friends. God alone is in control. He is sovereign in power. There's so much freedom that comes from embracing the fact that our Father in heaven is loaded. <laughs> He's loaded. And He loves us infinitely. This is the point, is that the illusions of the matrix are many and varied. Right? We live under the spell of worldly thinking all the time, but we don't have to. We can decide, we can have a choice that we're going to abandon the illusions of our world and our culture and we're going to embrace the truth of Scripture, the truth of God's Word. And here's, here's the beautiful thing that happens when we begin to abandon all of our illusions. The only thing that we're left with is Christ. Christ alone. And then He redefines everything. He redefines Tom. You're not even a teen. You, you think God can't use you? You're wrong. You think you're too young? You're too old. You're too inexperienced. You're too jaded. Christ redefines Tom. And when he says it's Tom, it's Tom. Asking Asking, what do you want me to do with my life? Christ, Christ redefines death. Don't live under the dread of death or the fear of death or even this notion that somehow there's some discontinuity between this life and the next, that there's some hard stop. There's no hard stop. We have forever. If you have Christ, you have forever. And your forever is going to be full of joy and peace and love, and there is no suffering or mourning or pain, right? Because the former things will have passed away. He's our resurrection and our life, and he redefines this notion of death. He redefines success. The only way that he can redefine success in your life is if you surrender every definition of success that you already have in your life. That these are the things that I have to do or that I have to be or, or, or this is the amount of money that I have to have in the bank or these are the, you know, the credentials that I have to have earned in order to feel valid. You have to let them go. You have to let every piece of it go because he created you with a purpose. And the only thing that matters, it's not the degree, it's not the job title, it's not the income, it's not the accolades, the only thing that matters is did I do what was on God's heart for me to do? That's it. When Jesus died, he said, right before he died, he, said, he looked up and said, Father, I've done all that you've asked me to do. You think about his crazy life and all the things that he could have done. He wasn't burdened by what he could have done. He knew that he had done what God had given him to do, and that was success. Let him redefine your version of success, and let him redefine your, your perspective on wealth and control. You might think you're poor. Don't. And you might think you're rich. Stop. Just think of yourself as related. You're sons and daughters of God. He had got you. He knows what you need before you need it. He's, he's made a provision before there was ever a need. Our wealth comes from the fact that we're His. 
His hand is the hand that moves the world. He makes a way when there is no way. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he has adopted us as his own. So would you pray with me? I mean, these illusions, like we've been raised with them. We've been taught to see the way that we see all of our life. And it is very hard to abandon them. It's the work of the Holy Spirit where he would take these burdens off of us created by these lies and illusions that we could leave this place with a light heart and a song in our step because we're his and he's got us. Lord, we love you. I pray in this moment, Lord, as I've spoken this morning, you have pinged people in their hearts related to specific issues, specific challenges that feel like enormous burdens and obstacles because, Lord, they're beyond our control. But this morning we testify they're not beyond yours. Lord, nothing is bigger than you. And we ask forgiveness for carrying the burden. We ask forgiveness for leaving the lie. And we want to walk this morning in the truth, letting you redefine every word in our life. Do you want to live for him, my friends? You want to give your whole heart to him? Then right now, right now, in this moment, you tell him so. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your destiny. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. And thank you that you have adopted us as your own. And Lord, till, till that moment that we get to be with you face to face, you're going to take care of us in a magnificent way. Thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing and just declare his goodness and the evidence of his spirit in our life. And I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see the evidence of your goodness. 
Amen. Well, I'm going to close us with a benediction, but just appreciate uh, Pastor Robin bringing that word because the Lord wants us to walk in freedom, and He is a good Father, and He wants us to have that joy and that peace in life, no matter what circumstances we go through, whether, you know, I, I had a pastor friend that said one time uh, he had great success, and he, he was afraid that pride was entering his heart. And he got on his knees, he said, God, how do, I, how do I deal with success? And the Lord said, the same way you deal with failure, trust me. That's the illusion, success and failure. And just knowing that we're to walk with the Lord. He's a good, good father, and uh, he cares for us. And he has a future and, and, a, and a hope and a blessing for every one of us. He wants to prosper each one of us in, in our relationship with him, with each other with our families. Uh, he is so good. So with that, let's close with this. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you. That's invoking His presence upon each one of you. May He give you His shalom, His wholeness, His peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And have a great week, a great Thanksgiving. Blessings to each one of you. Amen.